Welcome, everybody. My name is Dave Frank. Welcome to my 12th Internet Master Class. We have a beautiful night here in New York City, and we're coming to you live from our new jazz yoga space right in the middle of town called Hari NYC. So we're pleased to have you with us. Took a long time to put this place together, but we're pleased to be here, and we're looking forward to a lot of great events. Tonight, uh, it's a beautiful night in New York City. It's just the kind of night where you're grateful to be alive. And so it's a great night to study the Grateful Dead. As usual, I'll play a little bit. You can find the notes on my website, www.dayfrankjazz.com. And we're going to have a real ethereal evening. And I thank you for all tuning in.
Okay. All right. Okay. Tonight, read along with me, if you would, with your notes. I'm very, very pleased and proud to present a master class on the Grateful Dead. And in particular, tonight we're going to be analyzing one of their great all-time improvisations, compositions, entitled Dark Star. And that Dark Star is a collective composition, improvisation, performed by the Grateful Dead, and originally released on the classic LP Live Dead in 1969. This incredible 23-minute musical tapestry is an excursion to the astral world involving beautiful and powerful melodies, modal harmonies, undulating waves of musical sound, contrapuntal lines, changing rhythms, and a unique telepathic musical empathy between the band members. Dark Star was an example of the spirit of the Woodstock generation. That's us old guys. <laughs> At its best. Creative, explorative, cooperative, boundary-pushing boundary musical and communal genius. The first thing we'll do is let's just listen for a bit to some of this composition. This is a 23-minute piece. They don't really make those much anymore. You're not going to hear any of those on the radio. But there's a reason why it is 23 minutes, and that's because they have 23 minutes of music to say. Um, when, I, when I got back into this this week and, and started listening, it really um, occurred to me that what the dead were doing here was taking you to another world, and that's why everybody loves it. And I'm just going to read a little description from a wonderful book called Journey to Self-Realization by Paramahansa Yogananda. And this is about the astral world. And this is where I believe the dead are trying to take you with this music, and I think they succeeded. The astral world is the subtle sphere of God's creation, a universe of light and color, composed of finer than atomic forces, vibrations of life energy or life trons. Every being, every object, every vibration on the material plane has an astral counterpart. For in the astral universe is the blueprint of our material universe. So what the dead were always able to do for most of us is kind of open up another dimension, and that's why it's very difficult to worry about anything when you listen to this music. So usually when we talk about our master classes, I give two analogies. One is the Swiss watch, and this is very applicable tonight. And so if you look at a Swiss watch, it's very nice, it tells the time, but if you were to turn it around and open it up and look at what's inside, that's where it gets really interesting, and you can see all the different parts moving together. With great music, you have the same thing. When you're creating music, then you're creating it using various concepts. And in this situation, not only are, the, are these great musicians using concepts, but they're all using collective concepts as well as individual concepts, and that's what's so interesting to hear with this music. Miles Davis said, that the difference between a great musician and an average musician is the same as the difference between a great boxer and an average boxer. That the great musician and the great boxer are using higher theories. So a beginning boxer would come out and just flail, but Muhammad Ali waits, and he's taking it slow, and then boom. And so it's these kind of higher concepts of performance that fascinate me about all great music, and that's what I'd like to share with you tonight with the Grateful Dead. So this is really a classic of 20th century music, and it, it, it imbues the whole experience of being alive at that time. Uh, when this record was put out, I was just turning 13. I was um, at a summer camp upstate New York, in upstate New York, and the directors of the camp heard that Joan Baez was doing a concert nearby, and so they decided to take the upper bunks of the 
camp, which I was in, to see Joan Baez. This was in 1969. And so we went to this concert, and when we got there, it was Woodstock. (laughs) (laughs) Which was really something. And that whole experience we can hear in this music, and it was never better captured than this. So let's listen a little bit to Dark Star, Grateful Dead, 1969. And then I'm going to share with you some of the concepts that I've been able to pick up about this great creation. And then we'll listen to it all the way through. So this is a meditation evening, everybody. Get into your favorite meditation posture and just go with the flow, because this music is going to take you someplace real fun.
Okay, to me that's one of the most beautiful improvisations I ever heard. What's so unique about this music is that it's group improvisation. So it's one thing to study your whole life, as I often say, to waste your whole life on this music and we're, we're learning how to play it, and to sit at the piano or at the saxophone or the guitar and improvise. That's a great thing. But for a group of people to do it together and be able to balance their internal processes with the group process is really an accomplishment. And I've been reading about it in uh, Phil Lesh, the um, bass player's book, and he said they would just play for hours every day for months at a time. And you really begin to experience music as a telepathic language after a while. And these guys did it. So. Um, the basic question is, how do you keep a piece of music like this going if it's improvised? So this piece is a combination of uh, composed melodies and lyrics. There are certain riffs and lines that they play together that are set ahead of time, but almost all of it is improvised. So the question is, how do you create something in the moment that's never been created before with, another, with a group of people and make it hold together as a work of art. So the first thing I want to explain is some ideas about how you can do that, whether you're playing solo or we're playing with the group. The first thing that holds the music together is the pulse of the music. So the pulse of this piece is about 176 on the metronome, which is about here again. One, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, five, two, down. That's a fairly quick pulse about 176. So everybody in the band is feeling that pulse going in. The pulse is one thing that glues the different players together and creates the musical happening. When you talk about rhythm, we're always talking about two layers of rhythm. One is called the pulse, which is the metronomic pulse behind the music, which is just the steady beat. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. This is in four, three, four, one, two, three, four. That metronomic beat, or the pulse, remains underneath the music at all times, and everybody's feeling that at all times. Now, against that basic pulse, you can superimpose what we call a substratum. And a substratum means the basic rhythmic experience and the basic rhythmic groove that you're playing with. So the pulse could be here, for example. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. And you can play right with that pulse. That would be playing right with the pulse. You can superimpose over it eighth notes, which is what the Grateful Dead are doing here most of the time. And this eighth note groove is what holds this music together along with the scale they're using. So an eighth note groove sounds like this. Here's our pulse. One, two, three, four. Eighth note groove is this. New York, 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 New York. Like this. New York, New York, New York, New York. Everybody's feeling that. That's one of the things that's holding the music together is the, the pulse 
and then what we call the substratum above that pulse. Sometimes the substratum can change, and you can have, for example, a triplet substratum. That would sound like this. And sometimes they go into this. One, two, and this one we usually call Tennessee, 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 Tennessee. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. That's a, a triplet substratum. An eighth note substratum would be, a, a sixteenth note substratum would be even faster. That would be Mississippi. And that would go like this. You can combine these different substratums, which is what the Grateful Dead does, and Jerry specifically does. So sometimes he'll be uh, moving with the eighth note substratum. New York, New York, New York, New York, then one and two and three and four and one and two. Sometimes with triplets. Tennessee, 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 Tennessee. <laughs> and then sometimes with sixteenth notes. But the basic substratum of all improvised music is the eighth note substratum. So it doesn't matter what style of music you're listening to, if you're listening to rock or jazz. Uh, I was going to say Liberace, but I'm not sure if he's exactly with the program. But it's that eighth note uh, groove that holds the music together. So when you're improvising music, what you're trying to do is you're trying to basically be a channel for music. So the music already and always exists. What the great musician is trying to do is to channel that music. And the key to channeling the music is the rhythmic groove. So in this case, the eighth notes, if you can feel that groove of the eighth notes, that will connect you to the flow of music that's within you. And that music will unfold, and basically you just need to have the chops through practice and the theory understanding to be able to channel that music. But the basic music comes in on the wings of this eighth note groove, and we hear that all throughout this Grateful Dead improvisation. So you might have a couple of people playing the eighth note groove kind of off each other, but this is the feeling that holds it together. kind of get that groove going and you understand the scales, the music can flow of itself. And that's what the Grateful Dead was trying to do. And I think they accomplish it here to an incredible degree. So we have the basic pulse, and then we have the eighth note groove on top. And now to that, they basically add one scale. So what we're basically hearing with this extended piece, is one scale put through as many possible permutations as you could possibly think of. It's like wringing as much lemon juice out as you can of the lemon. You just keep squeezing and more keeps coming out. So the scale that the Grateful Dead is using here is what we call a mixolydian mode. So this whole piece, with very little variation, and there are some interesting variations, is all based in a mixolydian. An A mixolydian scale goes like this. A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G, A. For our musician friends, it's a D major scale starting from its fifth degree. A mixolydian is a major scale that starts and ends on the fifth degree. So if we have a regular D major scale, but we start it and end it on the fifth note, that's what we call a mixolydian mode. And modal music is a form of improvisation that was started by Miles Davis and my teacher Lenny Tristano, whom I always mention. 
And the Grateful Dead picked this up from people like John Coltrane and Miles Davis. So when you're playing modal music, you're not improvising over chords. You're improvising over a scale. This is also what Eastern music is about to a large degree, like ragas. You're basically improvising endlessly over a scale. And every different mode has a different mood. So this Mixolydian mode is really uplifting and really pleasant and kind of heavenly and astral and really enjoyable. So you have this sound. That's a certain mode and the dead are jamming on that for 23 minutes basically. Now you might have another mode that might have a very different sound. So if we have a major scale just for the sake of argument and we start it for example on the second degree or Let's try the third degree. That's a different feel. So if we have a D scale, and we start it and end it from the third note, which is an F sharp, that's a whole different feeling. It's kind of mysterious, maybe a little Eastern. If we start it from like the fourth note, that would be a G. Right now we're all hearing it based on that Mixolydian, but you can try this at home. This is one of those things you want to try at home. And that is that every different mode has a different mood. So the mood of this Mixolydian scale is very uplifting. And that's definitely why they chose it. Also, it's played in the key of A, which is a guitar key, but it's also a bright key, generally considered a bright key. So you might have, for example, Bill Evans start a lot of his pieces in, in A and then move to a more a darker key for improvisation. Okay, so if we put together the, the, so, uh, the, the pulse, the substratum, and this scale, this is the foundation of what these guys are using to create their music. So it's one, two, three, four, diga, 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 diga. <laughs> are completely endless and that's what makes improvising so much fun but the great improviser has theories again that they're using to create the music it's not just kind of haphazard it's in the moment and it's spontaneous but there are very um, clear guiding principles that are behind any great musician that we hear okay in this piece they make regular use of this incredible undulation of sound. And the undulation of sound is this swelling and rising and falling, rising and falling. This piece is all about rising, and they bring the whole group in, and they have a strong, a strong beat, and then it's falling, and it's kind of uh, decomposing, and then it's composing, and then it's decomposing and composing, and it's almost like waves coming in from the ocean. And no matter what, if the wave is coming in or not, there are all these little birds that are on the ocean that are still kind of jumping around. So you see these big waves come in of sound, all these creations, the whole group is working together, it's a big swell, and then it recedes. And you basically just have those birds dancing on the, floor, on the shore. That's constant in this piece, and we'll hear that as, as we listen to it again. But it's, it's such a beautiful concept, how they do it, and that's where the intuitive a telepathy comes in. They can feel it rising and they go with the rise and then they let it fall and they go with the fall and then they rise it again. The whole thing may be nine or ten risings and fallings. And so that's another really great guiding concept that the dead were using here. Okay, in, in addition to um, improvisation, there also are composed parts of this piece which they would play more or less the same way every time. And these composed parts include riffs and lines and also melodies and lyrics. So you can turn to your second page there. The lyricist for the Grateful Dead was an utter genius. And the words he created to this ethereal music were also so ethereal. 
and Robert Hunter is his name. And this piece, Dark Star, was written by Robert Hunter lyrics and Jerry Garcia music. And the lyrics are just incredible. Dark Star crashes, pouring its light into ashes. Well, that's, that's pretty cool right there. Reason tatters, the forces tear loose from the axis. Slurchlight casting for faults in the clouds of delusion. It's, it's beautiful words to go with this beautiful music. Uh, he, he, they, what were they on? Is that's, I'm, I'm, sh I'm, sure, I'm sure something. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this is very, very high language to go with very, very high music. And every member of this group, including the lyricist, was just a genius. And when you put it all together and spend all day practicing it for a period of time, and then plus you add whatever it is that you're on, <laughs> and you add that you're in the 1960s and everybody else is doing the same thing, all this can happen. Okay, so we'll, we'll hear the, the, the lyrics come in and the melody come in, uh, but the melody doesn't come in until about six minutes into the song. And this is so interesting to me, is that if you put on a pop song now, you'll never hear hardly any music without the melody and somebody singing. But the dead gave you six minutes of transcendental beauty before the song started. And this is, this is the greatness of instrumental music, is that you can create so much just with instruments and notes and sounds, and then they bring the whole great words and, and the lyrics in, and that becomes like a pillar of this improvisation. So they have a long period of, of improvising, and then they, they bring in the melody and the lyrics, and then they go into more jamming, so on and so forth. It swells, it rises, it falls. The lyrics don't come back in until about 20 minutes into the song. So a combination of improvisation and composition is what they're thinking of to keep this together. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a real good question, Brian. Thank you. Uh, the question was, because this is rock music, are the dead using a straight eighth note as opposed to a classical eighth note? The answer is yes, and that's really important. So if we have a jazz piece, like I was playing at the beginning, the eighth note groove, it's always a basic eighth note groove is the feel to all improvisation at its core. So if you're playing a jazz piece, I'll take it slower. The eighth notes are what we call swing eighth notes. I'll start with the straight ones because it's easier to hear. These are called straight or classical eighth notes, which means they're even. We have an even New York, New York, New York, New York, New York, New York. With swing eighth notes, we make the first one longer than the second. And even though you can probably make a mathematical equation out of it, it's better just to feel it. So swing eighth notes, here's straight eighth notes. One and two and three and four and New York, New York, New York, New York. Swing eighth notes is what we usually use more in jazz, and that's... Straight eighth notes, swing eighth notes, and that accounts for, it's, it's a lot has to do with the rhythm, because in jazz the underlying rhythm is very steady, so we have that swing eighth note and that kind of makes it bounce a little bit. In rock we have a much more complicated, in this sense, much more complicated rhythm, so the eighth notes are more even and it, it doesn't make it sound stiff. In jazz it would sound stiff if you, if you used uh, classical eighth notes. Some, something would feel wrong about it. But in this kind of music we can use the classical straight eighth notes because the rhythm is more syncopated. New 
York, New York, New York, New York, New York, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and one and two. Does that make sense, people? You hear the difference? So you can focus on playing music and you can focus at any moment on the rhythm of it and that's where you can draw a lot of inspiration. And so, again, the dead is focusing on this pulse and then everything is happening around that pulse and you have this eighth note substratum that, that ties it all together and then you can go from there and change it. Okay, um, there are certain lines that are composed that they use at certain places in, in this composition. And a lot of times they do that uh, to kind of tell you that another section of the piece is about to come. So they'll improvise and go in all, all kinds of directions, and then they'll bring you back to a focal line. And that will usually tell you, well, now we're about to start the song. So you, you're kind of shifting gears in a car. So you're kind of cruising, and then all of a sudden you go into a different gear. And that's what these lines usually tell you. OK. Um, each of the players in the group has a distinct musical role that they're filling. And this has to do with the basic sound of the music and the basic, what we call the oral landscape. So in the, in the dead, the, the different parts of the musicians are very clearly defined, although there's some, there could be some drift there. But that's what I wanted to show you with this. This is the basic landscape that we're hearing with the Grateful Dead in this type of an arrangement, this type of improvisation. It will change based on the type of music they're playing or the type of piece they're playing. But in this improvisation, these different defined roles help to keep it together. So we have Mickey and Bill, Mickey Hart, Bill Kreutzmann on drums. They keep a low vibration with the lower drums. That's the lowest vibration of the music, along with the bass. And they change the intensity of the drumming based on what part of the rising and falling they're in. So if it's in a rising phase, they'll increase the drumming and they'll make it heavier and deeper and more regular. If they're in a falling phase, they'll lighten the drums and they'll just kind of dance a little bit on the cymbals and things like that. And you can hear that all working together when they're, when they're rising and falling. So uh, we have the drums as the lowest oral sound. Then we have Phil Lesh on bass, who really has an incredible role in this music. And the more you study it, the more innovative he seems, because he played the bass differently than anyone else. So he and Jerry always improvise together. Oh, mo most of the time improvise together. So the basic sound we're hearing in this composition and improv is we hear the drums, we hear the bass, and the guitar improvising together with this kind of eighth note feel in the Mixolydian mode. So there are a lot of things that they're aware of that are tying this all together. And then in the middle of all that, we have Bob Weir playing great rhythm guitar. And the, the rhythm guitar is basically there to give you harmony. And Bob does that with a, with a kind of a strong pick. So he creates a real nice ambiance. So for example, Phil is down here, usually. The range of the bass is usually below middle C, down about here, and then he would, he'll bring you all the way down here. When he wants to give you more of a bass, like a power bass function, he'll really pop it. Otherwise, one of the things that's so unusual about Phil's playing is that he plays up here with his bass. And that's a real unusual function for a bass, because most of the times in bass, basses go like Or maybe a, like a jazz bass, very even. But Phil's playing all over the beat, and he's improvising eighth note lines, which is very unusual. He creates a lot of patterns in these lines at, that start and stop, 
So you hear a little musical phrase, and it'll, it'll hold. So there'll be moving notes, and then it'll hold for a moment. And those patterns are what makes music out of the sound. So music is usually described as ordered tones. In this case, Phil is playing usually short, shortish kind of lines, a lot of times with eighth notes in them. And occasionally he'll go down and he'll give you a low root. And when he really wants to accentuate it, he'll move it down. And then the gongs come in, boom, boom. It's outrageous. Now, if you put Jerry's up here, generally in this part of the piano, which is the range, if you take middle C, and you can start oh anywhere above middle C, and then you can go all the way high, all the way up to about here. This is Jerry's domain for the most part. He's up here creating the same type of line that Phil is with a bit of a different rhythm. Whenever you're improvising, you're always trying to create a complete musical sentence with everything that you play. So just like language, language wouldn't make sense if it was just words strung together. But when words become a sentence, then all of a sudden it's language and it has meaning. With music, it's the same way. Jerry's always trying to create a complete musical phrase. Sometimes he might want to create an incomplete musical phrase, but he's doing it on purpose. He's doing that completely. But most of the time, you want to hear a complete phrase, just like a, mu like a, a sentence in language. And then you'll pause at the end, just like you would with a sentence. I went to the store, I bought me some bread. Then I went home and went me to bed. So we're using that basic pulse. We have the substratum of the eighth notes. We have the mixolydian scale. And then we're making sentences and statements out of it. And fills down here. And they're playing what we call contrapuntal. They're playing together, creating together. That's that kind of feel. Now, in the middle of all that, the great Bob Weir is playing these beautiful little harmonic patterns that are also, for the most part, based on the A mixolydian scale. So the rhythm guitar, the function, is to give you the harmony. And so that would sound like this. Sometimes he uses triads, like an A triad to a G triad. But you can also use any type of pattern based on the mode. And this is very interesting for all you rhythm guitarists and keyboardists and chord instruments. When you're playing modal music, you can use what we call a modal fragment. And a modal fragment can be any three, usually three, could be two, could be four, could be five, but three is typical. Three notes from the mode in a certain kind of a, an order. So in this case, we're going to use two notes together, like an A, a D, and an E, and then an A on top. This is what we call a modal fragment. It's part of the mode. And you can actually use this same little fragment, like it's a cookie cutter, and move it up and down through the mode, make melodies with the top note. And this would be some of what's going on in the middle while these Jerry and Phil are improvising. Bob will be doing these kind of things. You can use triads. Usually very kind of melodic patterns. He, he uses some real beautiful ones. A lot of times he plays a chord and then hold, uh, plays a note after it. So if I took this kind of a uh, uh, structure, E, G, B, D, 
and moved it up the A mixolydian scale. It's endless what you can do. You can do And so the rhythm guitar is often doing that kind of thing in the middle, and that gives harmony to the whole thing. But the challenge for this, of course, is that since you're playing for 23 minutes on one scale, how do you make that interesting? Well, you, you'll often change the types of things that you're doing. You might go from a triad. And you might go into fourths. So it's all going on at the same time. We have Jerry up here. Phil down here. And Bob in here. When they bring it down, that low bass maybe goes away, and then they concentrate on creating lines together. And then it will begin to build again. This is some of what's going on. I'm sure not even the Grateful Dead know everything that's going on. That's part of the fun, is that no matter how much you can explain this stuff, nobody knows how it works. But the concepts guide you as you create, and that's true of any kind of creative musician in any style of music, is that you're guided by concepts. And in, in this piece of music, we can see it. OK, there's so much to say. Um, I do want to get, uh, this, uh, let me just mention a couple of things from the notes. You can read more about it when you get a chance. Um, so Phil is generally playing freely on the mode. He's not playing chords, but he's playing all over the mode. The gift is that when you play on a mode, if you do it in the right rhythm, it's usually going to sound pretty good. And that one mode can create infinite different melodies. Now, an interesting thing about Phil's playing is he plays with what we call an implied beat. And this is another one of his great innovations. A, there are two kinds of beats that you can show the audience if you're playing. One is a, what we call a direct beat. And that would be a very steady beat where the audience is hearing exactly where every beat is. One, two, three, four, like a jazz. Swing bass again. Boom, 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 boom. Every beat is very clear. You could hear it like this. One, two, three, four. Very clear where the beats are. That's called a direct beat. An implied beat is where you're not giving that kind of a direct beat to people, but you're playing around the beat. And if you play around the beat long enough, people are going to start feeling where the beat is. It's almost like seeing the negative of a picture. So instead of showing like a picture of a cat, they'll show the outline of a cat, and you'll see everything else very clearly. And then pretty soon, if you look at it, oh, I see. That's a cat. So Phil's playing an implied beat. So the beat is here. A lot of times off the beat. If 
But if you keep hearing that, you're going to feel this underlying pulse. And that's kind of rhythmic genius, that he's not giving it to you, but you will feel it after a while. And that's modern art. That's exactly how Picasso takes a guitar and breaks it up into a million pieces and makes it modern. And then you can kind of see the guitar, but it looks like maybe something else too. That kind of subtlety is, is what we call the implied beat. Okay, there's so much to say about this music, I do want to say more. Okay, I got to get into this Jerry concept. Okay, I'm going to do that. Because Jerry's using tremendous amount of concepts when he's improvising, and it's really interesting. So I'm going to go a little bit quickly so we can get back to the music. But you can take this, these basic notes if you like and, and listen to the piece. And, and I think you'll appreciate what's happening, hopefully, a little differently. So Jerry use, he, Jerry's playing up here. One of the things he uses is short phrases. So that short phrase is generally considered one to two measures long of a continuous line. So a short line would be... It's a complete sentence. That's called a short line. So he plays a lot of those, and he's constantly searching for these within the mode. So within the mode, you can come up with an infinite number of short phrases. And the common denominator is that we're using mostly eighth notes. New York, New York, New York, New York. And we're making a complete sentence with every phrase that we're playing. <laughs> Characterized by moving notes and held notes. So we're ear always hearing Jerry make beautiful, beautiful melodies in this way. So here's another short phrase. Uh, here's another one. Try again. One. Now all the deadheads know where it's going next. <laughs> one more short phrase. Coming from the same mode, it's a complete phrase or a complete idea, and it's done in a short way, like a short sentence. I am going to the store, short sentence. Okay, Jerry creates these beautiful, majestic lines that are often done by an ascending movement of the notes of the mode, and he also shifts the weight of the notes, so certain notes are given a lot of weight, and the melody is that way. One, two. Okay, that's like a majestic feel. The, the, the line is ascending. And he puts a lot of weight here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, that's an example of like a majestic type of phrase that he creates. And he can pull these right from the ethers. And it's incredible to hear. Here's another one. One, two, three, four, five, Only he can play with his inflection, but you get the idea. One, two, three, four, five, That's a beautiful melody. And it just comes right from space. That is proof there is a God. Okay. One basic form of improvisation is called imitation. When you're creating music, if you're composing or improvising, what you're doing a lot of the time is you're looking for a beautiful little melody, and then rather than go someplace else, you're going to twist that melody around. So the most common one we always give is... And where does he go next? Da -na -na -na. Okay, that's what makes the piece. Jerry's doing that all the time. And there are two kinds of imitation. Imperfect imitation and perfect imitation. Perfect imitation is when you're playing the same exact phrase, 
the same exact way. One, two, three, four. You can do that a few times. That's called perfect imitation. Maybe you'll do it here. Imperfect imitation is when you change something about the phrase. So, Jerry does like here. It's so subtle, and he's doing it right in the moment. He's subtly changing it. This is called addition, when you add something to your phrase. A triplet. Double notes. And you can do it in so many ways. Basically, when you're improvising, you'll try to come up with a nice phrase. And maybe it'll vary a little bit. And there's a little guy in your head who will tell you exactly how many times to do it before you go somewhere else. And that's the part of the art of the great improviser, is he'll take, make up a phrase, twist it around a little bit, and then do it maybe two, three times, four times, whatever that little guy's telling him, then he drops it and goes somewhere else. That's what we call addition. That's when we add something to the phrase. You can also use subtraction, which is taking it away. Watch. First it's a four groove. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Then it's a three groove, the same thing. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's called ringing a lot of lemon juice out of the lemon. All right, now, for all you musicologists, something very cool is called adorning a mode. Adorning a mode. So we're saying that basically the whole piece is this mode. But you can add a half step to it here and there, which we call adorning the mode. And you can do that any place in the mode. You just put a little one in here and there, and it creates just a little variety in the lemon juice. And Jerry's using that not a whole lot, but just a little. We just added an F to the scale. There we added a C to the scale. And you try to make it melodic, and you can use almost any half step on the mode occasionally, and that's called adorning the mode, and it really creates just that little subtle difference. So here he's using this. That note is not in the mode, but he makes it melodic, and it just kind of makes your skin curdle a little bit. And here's the famous one here. This note is not in the mode. But he's just putting it in just a little bit. Just to make you go like, what's that? Beautiful. Okay, eighth notes and triplets. Eighth notes is New York. New York, New, New York, New York, New York, New York. Triplet is Tennessee. Tennessee, da 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 This line, he does that. Dum, da ga do, ga ga da ga da ga da ga da 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 It's a subtle rhythmic change, and it just gives you a little more forward motion and breaks, breaks that even flow. So as much as you want there to be an even flow, an even concept, you also want to break it from time to time or else it gets too monotonous. And so these are various ways to do that. He loves going from six to five. One. This is a real kind of emphasis of emotion. And then he does the same thing from one, two. just adds a whole lot of emotion to the music there. Okay, then we have long phrases, what Jerry's really, really, really known for, and I really, really love this part, 
is he creates long phrases and he figured out a way to use different groups of notes within the same line. A one, two, three. Here he's using three. One, two, three, one, two, three, then four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, one, two. This is the signature part of his sound. One, two, three, 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 four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Beautiful concept. And it just kind of taps into the universe on a level of rhythm that's really interesting. Can you feel that? Okay, that's cool. Let's finish. He uses slides a lot on the top of the phrase. Usually it goes down either a step or a step and a half. Sometimes upwards. And it just changes the texture at that moment. He uses arpeggios and scales. E minor 7 arpeggio. And then more scale kind of stuff. Arpeggio is wider space of notes. Scales is narrower space of notes. Sometimes he uses the scales like a step by step and there's sometimes a wider thing. So with four notes you can create a line that goes almost an octave, or, or an octave, if you're using wider arpeggios. Four notes, you're going a whole space of an octave. Scales, you're only going four notes. So he's putting the two together. Okay. Okay, you can read about constant structure. Last thing I want to show you is something called going out of the mode, which he does basically one time towards the end, and it's wild. This is something that Lenny Tristano used to do all the time. He just takes you totally into a, a different mode for just a brief second. <laughs> Let's try that again. One. He's taking you into the B flat mode and then back into the A mode. It's just totally to mess your head up. So on and so forth. That's a beautiful technique. You could do that a lot more. call going out of the mode. I hope you can get something from that and it's something that is makes the study of music so fascinating and makes it so much of a lifetime study is that in addition to the great feelings you have all this very high intellect going on at the same time. So we're going to listen now to Dark Star and I'm going to talk you through it and we'll just see who stays awake till the end. But I want to thank you all for coming. It's been my pleasure to be here. And welcome to Hari NYC. We're at 140 West 30th Street near Penn Station, near 7th Avenue in New York City. We'll be doing regular master classes on everybody from Bach to Steely Dan, somebody saying, who knows? Generally, uh, in New York here, we'll be doing it every other week. If you're in New York, come by and say hello. We're daily yoga classes. This place is really, really cool. And so we invite you all to enjoy it. Okay, so this is a flow of Dark Star. 
So this shows you these ascending, rising, and falling. Okay, so we're starting kind of low. We hear Phil playing those bass lines and Jerry improvising together. And Bob's in the middle playing chords. Can you hear that? And the, the groove is the eighth note. Zuka, zika, zika, zuka, zika, 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 zika. He's just reaching for beautiful melodies within this mode. And the two, the bass and the guitar, are improvising together while the, while the rhythm plays harmony in the middle. Sometimes Phil takes a lead, sometimes Jerry takes a lead, and they play off each other. This is collective improvisation. It's all in the air, and everybody's responding to it. They have their own process, and then they have the group process, and they meld the two. That's a riff. Now we start with the song. And they bring the rhythm in here, beautiful rhythm and the rhythm guitar. So now this is the groove of the whole thing. Here's our beat. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Eighth notes. Ziga, booga, diga, duga, duga, do. And they're just setting that groove. Phil's on the bottom, Jerry's on the top, Bob's in the middle, drums are playing all over the place, keyboards are also in there, playing Jerry-like things. They're just letting you sit there. They don't do that in pop music much these days. But they're just letting you experience. There's a melody, a, a majestic melody. Now your intensity is building. We're here. JM stands for Jerry's Melodies. He's making those beautiful melodies with the sweetest sound you ever heard in your life. You just use a little adorn mode there. And the drums are keeping it all together with the groove. Bill has a lead. Keyboard plays. Usually, you'll see on the notes. There's a beautiful ascending melody. He's just reaching into the astral world, pulling out a melody. And you know you're there. If the melody brings you there. There's a little repetitive phrase. He'll do it until the little guy tells him to stop. Now we're building. Jerry's guitar was the sweetest sound I ever heard in my entire life when you heard it live. Brilliant. The sound itself was just absolutely gorgeous. Keyboard. Patterns. It's really building up. We're here. There's a repetitive thing. doing a repetitive phrase. Really intense. Yeah. There's a melody, a rip. Bam, bam, bam. 
Now it starts going down, the, the falling part. Not too far. This is a riff. That's planned. And this tells you that the song is almost going to start very soon. Yeah. That bass is so cool. And Jerry's dancing on top of it. Still building. Okay, now it starts to come down. So that was a whole huge, beautiful swell. And now they see how the rhythm breaks out. You're not hearing that low drum so much. You're just hearing little dancing cymbals like those little birds on the shore. Now the wave goes out. And Bob's playing beautiful things in the middle. Here's the melody of the song with these crazy lyrics. We are here. Keyboard behind. Pentatonic scale. This is called deconstruction. The whole thing just falls apart. All of a sudden, it's nothing. Through Now they're going to start to build again a little bit. Here's a riff. Here we're back into a jam. It starts to come up again. Bob's playing the things in the middle. These little rhythmic harmonic patterns. That keeps it together. And you have Phil and Jerry improvising. Very little rhythm. Now they have to bring a gong in, which we have one right here. This is going to build up to an incredible peak, and then Jerry's going to take a majestic lead. Yeah. The gong is on the third or the fifth. Now it's building up again. We're here. Yeah. Can't take it anymore. There's the line. Yeah. That's a beautiful melody, man. Using some triplets. This is classic. That's the groups. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Building it. starts to come down a little bit. Beautiful melody. Now he's going to repeat this phrase. He's going to repeat this one. Dum da dum change it. Da da dum da 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 And then he leaves it. That's cool, man. That's squeezing the lemon right there. Now we're back down again. All the way back here. Now they're playing Dixieland. The two of Phil and Jerry are improvising. Eighth note. Now a majestic melody. Yeah. Eighth note. Just kind of let it sit. Little building. Up. Ah. 
Here's a melody. Ba da ba da, ba ba da ba da, ba da ba ba, ba ba da ba da, ba da ba ba, ba da ba da. Yeah. Now they bring it down. Deconstruction. Yeah, every melody is beautiful. Changes the sound and goes way down here. He plays with this phrase. Majestic phrase ends on a chord tone or third or a fifth usually. Now we're back down. There's it adorning the mode, flat five. That's a funny note, but he makes it work. Almost nothing there. We're here back in. There's a little, the little birds on the shore just kind of dancing around. Now he kind of plays with these phrases. Jerry and Phil. And he, he, he distorts the fifth. The fifth can be distorted and it makes it sound weird. Here's a phrase. Now how long is he going to let it go? He's deciding in the moment, should I keep playing this or not? Now he does it in three. There, one, one, two, three, 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 there, it's over. Now he starts to deconstruct and he brings the phrase back again. And the keyboard joins beautiful. They're dovetailing two lines. They're all in the same mode, A mixolydian, all using the eighth notes. Making melodies within those parameters. Deconstruction. Beautiful line. Woo! There's Phil. Takes the lead. Now we're here bobbing them up. There's a majestic melody. Beautiful melody. Astral melody. Beautiful. There's a, an adornment of the mode. He's using a C. Just takes you out a little bit. Phil and Jerry playing together. Repeats the phrase. The drums kick in. Deconstruction. Bob's playing nice in the middle. Got that. Nice chords. Little rhythm. Yeah, some sounds come in here. It's always nice to use some non-musical sound somewhere. He's bending the fifth. Now it's deconstructing. Now here's the beat again. Two, three. Now they're gonna build it again. One, two, one, two, three, four. All this, these melodies come from the mode and the rhythm, and you just let them flow through you. 
He's building it again. Yeah. Bill's playing on the bottom. Yeah. Build it up. Yeah. We're here. Now we're going down again. Building up again. Sometimes they confuse you. Phil on the bottom. Jerry on top. Bob in the middle. Drums. Keys. Bell's big. T C and Sam is playing great. Keyboard player is playing great on this man. It's right there with Jerry. All the way down again. This might have something to do with the effect of the drugs on the system. <laughs> I'll take another toke now, please. <laughs> Acid, yeah. Now we're all the way back. This is Dixieland. Everybody's improvising together like it was like Bill Bailey or something. Short phrases. Playing off each other. But everybody's doing that concept at the same time. It's just endless what you can do with the one mode and the rhythms and whatever else is happening. There's our melody. Wow. Woo! Daga, daga, diddla, daga, daga. New York, New York, Tennessee, New York, New York, Tennessee, New York, New York, Tennessee, Tennessee, New York. Woo! That's a slide. Billion, billion, billion. We're here, 19. Coming down to like a jam. There's the out mode. Eighth note groove. I got to buy the open, see, I got to buy the open, see, I got to buy the open, see, I Phil's on the bottom. Jerry's on the top, Bob's in the middle. It's a Bob sandwich. There's a majestic melody. Now Bob, yeah, Phil was doing triplets. Yeah, six to five. Woo! Yep, just playing with that one idea. How, how long is it going to go on? Yeah. Da -da -da 
There's the melody. That now they're going to bring the vocals in again. That was the jam. Keyboard patterns. All pentatonic scale. Now it goes back and they're going to give you the, the song again. Almost goes to nothing. It's fantastic. It's a beautiful melody. Now the whole rhythm stops. Oh, not yet. Bring seeds in the nights of goodbye. Stops. Shall you and I while we can? Gregorian chanting. Now it's going down and ends on beautiful modal chords and then a distorted note at the end, which is gorgeous. Here it is. distortion <coughs> because they want to make it they want to make it weird a little it's a weird ending okay Thank you. if this kind of wacky stuff interests you there are many master classes uh, everything from Zappa to Dolphy to Charlie Parker Keith Jarrett Marx Brothers all on Ustream and YouTube all free, for nothing. Thank you for being here. Thank you for putting up with all this. I had fun.